Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Mr. Cleophas, CPAK Director and CEO of Cliffsum Consultants. Today, I want to just have a good summary of one of the topics in Section 4 and in Section 6, that is uh, the intermediate level and the advanced level of CPA. I want to talk and briefly summarize and discuss assurance engagement as a topic. So I welcome you all. Firstly, subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can be getting updates on any video I am going to be doing from now going forward. Because I know with my videos you're going to understand auditing and you're going to know how to approach the CASMEB exams and plus any other auditing exam, whether advanced auditing and assurance, whether auditing and assurance, or even the ATD level auditing uh, as a unit in ATD3. So welcome. I want to discuss assurance engagement. And I would like to start by defining assurance. We want to understand what do we mean by the term assurance. If somebody tells you he has assured you, what does the person mean? It is important to understand the term assurance before you continue and understand assurance engagement. If I'm telling you, I'm assuring you of a pass in section 6 or in section 4 in ATD3, it means I'm guaranteeing you. So an assurance is more of a guarantee and an audit is an example of a guarantee to the users of the audited financial statements that if they have invested in the company, their investment is safe. So that is to assure, to guarantee. So when we are defining assurance engagement, there are some terms you can never go without. So let me just define assurance engagement. Then from there, if you're making some short notes, I'm very sure you can just do the notes. You can rewind the video. So an assurance engagement is an engagement in which the practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the subject matter and against suitable criteria. That is the definition of assurance engagement. I've said it is an engagement in which the practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the subject matter and against the suitable criteria. So when discussing assurance engagement, you need to understand what do we mean by an engagement. In any engagement, there must be the terms of agreement. So whenever, even if you're doing an audit, whenever there's an engagement, there must be those terms of agreement. You need, in assurance engagement, we are saying it is an engagement uh, where the practitioner expresses a conclusion. In a normal audit of financial statements, you must use the auditor. The objective of an audit is to enable the auditor to express an opinion. And that is the conclusion of an audit. That report which the auditor gives with an opinion on whether the financial statements gives a true and fair view. It is an example of a conclusion. It is not only auditing which amounts or which qualifies to be an assurance engagement. That is why we say a practitioner, instead of using the term auditor, we use the term practitioner. Then we have said the practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended user. We have users of the audited financial statements, users of the auditor's report. We have the government. We have the shareholders or the investors. We have the public. We also have customers. We have employees plus others who normally use the audited financial statements and the auditor's report. So whenever we are talking of the, uh, the users, those are the ones we are referring to. And we have said it increases the confidence of the users other than the responsible party. When we talk of the responsible party, it is important for you to understand very well who is responsible when it comes to the subject matter. Who is responsible to prepare financial statements? In auditing, we do not say the accountant is responsible. 
we say is the management. So management is responsible to prepare financial statements. Many people, they say accountant, but it is the management because the accountant works after being given some tasks to handle by the management of the company. So in case of anything, management shall be held liable for any negligence of the accountant. That's why management, they are responsible of preparation of the financial statements of the company. And we are saying it is increasing the confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the subject matter. In case of an audit of financial statements, the subject matter of analysis is the financial statements. In my videos, in topic one, where I normally discuss the nature, purpose, and objective of an audit, when you go through my videos, you'll realize that I normally say, or I've been saying that the objective of, not the objective, but the subject matter of analysis in an audit of financial statements is the financial statements. That is what we analyze most. Those financial statements, income statements, cash flow statements, statement of financial position, statement of changes in equity. Those are the subject matter of analysis in an audit of financial statements. Then we have said about the subject matter and against the suitable criteria. In case, when we talk of the suitable criteria, these are the benchmarks. These are the standards used to analyze and evaluate the subject matter. We review or evaluate the subject matter of the financial statement based on the benchmarks, which are the standards, the international accounting standards, the international financial reporting standards, the international standards on auditing. Those are the standards we use to evaluate the subject matter of analysis. That is briefly the summary of the definition of the word assurance engagement. I want to go further and discuss what we call the components of assurance engagement. Any, for any uh, engagement to qualify to be called an assurance engagement, it must have the five elements of an assurance engagement. Number one, there must be an engagement process. This engagement process in involves the terms of engagement. And that is what we call the, either the engagement process or the evidence. The terms of engagement, the methodologies used to obtain adequate and sufficient evidence to base the conclusion. In any assurance engagement, another thing should be there, three-party relationship. There must be three parties involved in any assurance engagement. In case of an audit, the three parties will be the auditor. One is the auditor. The second party will be the, the person who is responsible to prepare the subject matter, and this is the management. The third person will be the user. It can be the investors, it can be the customers, etc. Et now, when we talk of the three-party relationship, and please, I mean three-party relationship, not third-party relationship. Many students, they confuse between three-party relationship and third-party relationship. I'm here to clarify it is three-party relationship. So when explaining in an exam, you say the three parties involves the practitioner, comma, the intended user, and the responsible party. Another component or element of an assurance engagement is the subject matter. Then when explaining, you say this is the subject of analysis on which a conclusion is to be expressed. Right? Then we need to understand another component, which is the subject matter. No, that's one I've said, the subject matter. Then we have the suitable criteria. Suitable criteria, you will explain and say, these are the benchmarks used to evaluate the subject matter. Then the last one is conclusion. Then you say this is the report which is based on the evidence obtained with respect to the subject matter. Those are the five components of an assurance engagement. I've said number one, engagement process or the evidence. Number two, the reporting relationship. Number three, I've talked of the suitable criteria. Number four, I've said about the subject matter. Then number five, I've talked about the conclusion. Those are the components 
I want to go again deeper and say, discuss what we call the levels of assurance and engagement. I want to explain those the three levels of assurance and engagement. And we have the first level, highest level of assurance. We have the second level, moderate level of assurance. We have the third level is the lowest level of assurance. Let me explain briefly about the highest level of assurance. This level of assurance is only given where the practitioner, who is now the auditor, is involved in an audit of financial statements. The reason is you can give the highest level of assurance where there is no scope limitation. In an audit of financial statements, the auditor does his work as per the standards. He cannot be limited. The scope of the audit can never be limited by management. We do our work as per the international standards on auditing or and also as per the Companies Act. With the management of the company cannot uh, limit the extent to which auditor does his work. And it is normally given in positive terms. E.g., I can just quote this and say, in our opinion, the financial statements which we have audited gives a true and fair view. So that is a positive narration or a positive conclusion or expression of the opinion. Thus, it gives the highest level of assurance that everything is okay with respect to the financial statements audited. Then number two, we have moderate level of assurance. And I will say this, that moderate level of assurance is expressed by the practitioner, where the practitioner has performed an attestation function or a review function. An attestation function is a function, or a review function is a function or where the practitioner is engaged in ascertaining whether the information reviewed complies with the benchmarks. And in a review engagement, you are limited to what you as the auditor should do. The scope is limited. The extent to which auditor is supposed to review the information given is limited or determined by the engagement party or the party who appointed the auditor or the practitioner to perform the task. And thus, there is no way you can give a higher, highest level of assurance where there is scope limitation. Instead, in case of a review engagement, then you give the moderate level of assurance. Then I can say this, it is given in negative terms by using words such as, I quote them, we have not detected any material misstatements in the financial statements. What does what that one tell you? It tells you that, that is the end of the quote, it tells you that we were suspicious, we were confirming, and we have not seen anything. Because when you're doing a review, you are there to confirm whether the information you are reviewing complies with the standards of the benchmarks. Number three, we have the lowest level of assurance. This one is expressed, or it's also known as, let me start by saying, it's also known as no assurance, meaning there is no assurance at all. It is expressed by the practitioner where he has performed a compilation engagement or where he has compiled the company information. It can be financial information or non-financial information on behalf of the client, meaning that he is not responsible in case of anything. And that is why in keeps in, in an example of a good uh, compilation engagement is the bookkeeping. An audit firm or an auditor can also provide other services like keeping the books of the company. Then bookkeeping, if you're keeping the books, you're not auditing, you're not reviewing. Thus, you cannot give an assurance. And then it is assumed you're giving no assurance or the lowest level of assurance. It is, uh, it can, it most, most of the time, it uses uh, a disclaimer or the practitioner may have a disclaimer to prevent reliance by any person in making decision based on the books prepared by him. He can say or give a disclaimer such as, 
we have not audited, comma, reviewed, or examined the accompanying information. And therefore, we do not take any responsibility for any loss suffered by any party. End of all quote. So that is a disclaimer. Disclaimer is a warning so that you can you, sh you are not going to rely on the information. I want now to talk about the types of assurance. We have three types of assurance. Number one, we have reasonable assurance. Number two, we have limited assurance. Number three, absolute assurance. I want to briefly again discuss and explain the three types of assurance. The intention for any engagement, of any, uh, yeah, any engagement, whether audits, whether review engagement, it is to reduce the chances of giving a wrong conclusion. And thus, in a, res a reasonable assurance when you're defining it, you normally say it is an assurance whose objective is to reduce the assurance engagement risk to a level that is acceptable in the circumstances of engagement. It is expressed in positive terms. Why? In case of, for you to give a reasonable assurance, the, the, the risk must be low. For, the reason, for there to be a reasonable assurance, or for you to express a reasonable assurance. Then, I want to explain about limited assurance. Limited assurance and reasonable, they have the same objective. That's why when defining, you say a limited assurance is an assurance whose objective is to reduce the assurance engagement risk to a low level in the circumstances of engagement. And it is expressed where the risk is high as compared to a reasonable assurance. And thus it is expressed in negative terms. And then we also refer to the limited assurance as also negative assurance. Reasonable assurance, we also refer to it as positive assurance. Then I want to explain about absolute assurance. If somebody is assuring you absolutely, or is if the person is absolutely giving you an assurance, he is assuring you 100%. So an, an absolute assurance is 100% assurance. It is not possible, when explaining you say it is not possible, for a practitioner to give an absolute assurance on the subject matter. The practitioner is only permitted to give a reasonable assurance or a limited assurance on the subject matter. These are the reasons why it is not possible to give an absolute assurance on the subject matter. One, due to the use of sampling technique in obtaining evidence. When you are doing an audit, you do not examine each and every transaction. You use the sampling technique. And some of the items which are not part of the sample, they may have be having some errors, some missing statements. Due to that, you cannot assure the users that everything is okay 100%. You can just limit the chances of giving a wrong conclusion. Thus, that is one of the reasons to why you cannot give an absolute assurance on the subject matter, I've said, due to use of sampling technique. Number two, it is because of lack of precision associated with the subject matter. Like when you look at the financial statements, they are not precise. They are so detailed. They have a lot of information. And due to that, there is no way you can give an assurance, and from an, assurance uh, an absolute assurance on the subject matter. Because the reason is there is a lot of information in the financial statements. They are so detailed. Thus, you can never give an absolute assurance on the subject matter. Number two, another reason is because that the responsible, the practitioner is not the responsible party or that the practitioner is not the one responsible to prepare the subject matter. That is, the subject matter is somebody else's responsibility. So due to this reason that the subject matter is not the work of the practitioner, is not the auditor if it is an audit. You know, the auditor will prepare the financial statement. Then there is no way he can give an, an absolute assurance because the person who prepared the financial statements or the subject matter, maybe he has concealed some of the errors. He has not errors, but a fraud. He has hidden some of the information. 
Thus, you cannot give an absolute assurance since the subject matter is somebody else's responsibility. Another reason is because it is not possible to just reduce or to just do away, not reduce. It is not possible to eliminate, that's the correct word, eliminate the risk associated with the subject matter. So the risk associated with the subject matter can only be reduced but cannot be eliminated. That is another reason why you cannot just give an absolute assurance. Then you have another one. Number next, you can say the responsible party, that is mostly the management, if it's an audit, they can misrepresent facts knowingly. They can give wrong information to the practitioner or to the auditor intentionally. And that one, we are very sure it has been happening. You can even give wrong information to the auditor or to any party intentionally. And due to that, you can never, as the practitioner or as the auditor, give absolute assurance. So those are the reasons why it's not possible to give an absolute assurance. One, due to the use of sampling technique. Number two, lack of precision associated with the subject matter. Number three, it is because the subject matter is someone else's responsibility. Number four, it's not possible to eliminate the risk associated with the subject matter, but it's, you can only reduce it. Then number five, the practitioner, not the practitioner, but the responsible party can misrepresent facts knowingly. The last concept I want to cover, which is the last concept in the topic, is the non-assurance engagement. When you are told to explain what is a non-assurance engagement, you say, this is an engagement which do not have the five elements of assurance engagement. And the truth is that the practitioner or the professional accountants, they also provide other services which are non-assurance in nature, which do not meet the criteria for the assurance engagement. Like compilation engagement, keeping company books. Number two, another example of an assurance engagement is filing of tax returns. Number three is management consultancy engagement because a an practitioner or an auditor can also provide other services apart from auditing. He can have other skills and knowledge in human resource area. Then he can provide the management consultancy as services. Another one is agreed upon procedures where the auditor or the practitioner agrees on the procedures to be performed and he agrees with the appointing authority then he goes ahead collects the evidence tables before them the findings to enable them uh, make informed decisions that is an agreed upon procedures engagement so those are some of the services the practitioner or the auditor can offer which are non-assurance services I'll say tax com from tax management consultancy, filing of tax returns, also tax consultancy is another one, agreeing upon procedures and compilation engagements. So that is about assurance engagement. You need to understand about also direct reporting is one of the concepts in assurance engagement. Direct reporting, it is an engagement where the practitioner is engaged by the responsible party, or not the responsible party, where is engaged by the appointing authority, to just do an analysis or to just carry out an analysis on the company's compliance. With the laws and regulations, then it shall report directly to the appointing authority on whether the company is in compliance or is complying with the relevant laws and regulations. That is a direct reporting engagement. He never reports go through any other person. He does the investigation alone. He does the, he carries out the task alone to investigate on the compliance of the company with respect to the laid down laws and regulations. And then he tables or he reports to the appointing authority on whether this company is complying with the relevant laws. So that is an assurance engagement. Thank you for being there. Thank you for watching. I'm very sure this one is going to help you in an exam. When you look at the past paper questions in section 6, there is a past paper question saying differentiate the level of assurance which is given in case of an audit of financial statements 
and in case of a review engagement? Let me answer that question. In case of an audit of financial statements, the practitioner will give the highest level of assurance. While in case of an, a review engagement, the practitioner will give the moderate level of assurance. Reason is because of the scope limitation in a review engagement. And I said the review engagement, another name is an attestation engagement. In case of an audit, there is no scope limitation. Risk is low. Then it gives the highest level of assurance in case of an audit of financial statements. Guys, I'm a lecturer at regional college. This regional college is one of the best colleges we're having in Nairobi, in Kenya. We are located at Moi Avenue in Nairobi, CBD. Moi Avenue, we are located in Commonwealth House. Commonwealth House, 50th floor, is where you can find us. Come, this Commonwealth House is opposite Galitos. Galitos is well known by many. It is opposite MKU. The MKU which is just in the same building where they share the building with Galitos. Before you reach archives. We are there. Come to 50th floor. Find me there. Ask for Mr. Clevers. You will find me. I will also help you in other units. Apart from auditing and advanced auditing and assurance. I am also teaching QA, quantitative analysis. I'm also teaching management accounting. I'm also teaching uh, I'm also teaching another uh, advanced management accounting. So come find me, we talk. I'll help you in passing these papers. Also the fundamental of accounting that is in ATD3. I'm also teaching the unit and statistics. Those in universities, any unit in statistics, any unit in auditing, any unit which is touching on cost accounting or management accounting, like operational research, you can link up with me. I can give you proper tuition. I can coach tuition you or be your tutor for some time, given that you are available online or even physically. And trust me, you're going to enjoy the paper when you do your exam and also get the knowledge. I'm a consultant in auditing, accounting and tax matters and finance matters. I've been a finance manager previously in a real estate company where I've been in charge. So please, I have the knowledge, I have the experience in the area. You can consult me through my number 0714-023-691. You'll get in touch with me. That is my personal number. That's my office number. You are going to reach me through that number. If you have any problem in keeping the books of your company, consult me. I can become, I can be the one to keep the records for you. I can be your internal auditor. I can give you ways on how you can just put controls to reduce frauds and errors in your company and to have proper and effective systems running in your company, which will reduce the many issues and problems of frauds, errors in your company. So be with me. Link up with me. Get in touch with me. I am Cleophus. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being with me. Let me